this podcast is is open service to bringing in what I call best in breed. So people that live, eat, breathe, sleep, property investing, and uh, and they're people at the top of their game. They're people that are uh, leading the way. That your community uh, of like minded people that want to grow and succeed through investing in property and doing it very very well. Today's guest, when we speak about community, nails the community side on what they're trying to help and pass on that information and seeing property investors succeed. And if you're not familiar with him, you better fix that and check him out online because he's got a wonderful following, a very loyal and advocate following as well. Welcome to the show, PK Gupta. Thank you so much, Aaron. I I appreciate um, the invite. No, no, it's wonderful to have you here, and, uh, and we're very privileged. Uh, I know that you've, uh, like I mentioned, you've got uh, not only a great track record personally, but for your clients. Now, starting to see that track record filter through and giving them the confidence uh, and the ability to buy as well. So we'll kind of cover that and a lot more as well. But to give our listeners a bit of background, uh, a little bit about you, you're a dad, a husband, so automatically I'm like, I feel you, I hear you, <laughs> uh, great position to be in. And also you're a property investor and looking at your own personal portfolio, we're talking about a mix of residential, commercial and development as well. That's now giving you that six-figure passive income. So I want to say a huge congratulations to you, mate. Taking action, getting the results as well, mate. So well done. Thank you, man. I'm very grateful. You're based in Brisbane and I look at you, I've seen that you're helping people all over the country uh, and off the back of using high cash flow properties along with uh, high growth as well. It's very much data-led, data-driven with a view to get that passive income as well. And your, when I say community and your audience numbers, we're talking you know, over 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, 15,000 uh, deep community on Facebook. That doesn't happen overnight and that doesn't happen without proof of concept as well. So that's what I really want to yeah, really want to pick your brain about as well. So congrats, mate. But before we kick off, it's what I call the three Ps. So live about yourself personally, professionally, and your property journey, if you may indulge us. Okay. Um, so personally, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I try not to identify as a property investor per se, because it's kind of a weird thing to identify myself as. But like you said, um, yeah. dad, husband, all that kind of thing. I think one thing that I think is super crucial um, to anything in life is meditation. So, per, you know, when you talk personality or, or personal um, yeah, I'm a big advocate of meditation. I meditate two hours every morning. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Lovely. Um, and what AM club do you subscribe to if you're getting up uh, <laughs> for two hours there? Well, I'm a dad. So I have I have a three and a half year old who's at kindy at the moment. So I yeah. try to get up at 4.30, but to be honest, yeah. like these days, the alarm gets snooze maybe <laughs> three or four times. So it's more like five o'clock, but, but it could be better, but I'm still happy I'm doing it. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. And I mean, that's a, that's a practice that you know, you've built up probably over time and the discipline around that. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's, it's really transformative as whoever listens or, or watches your show. And if they do yeah. it, they'd, they'd know as well. Ah, fantastic. And then your own property journey. Take us through that in a nutshell. Yeah, sure. Um, like in, in a nutshell, we, my, my wife and or then girlfriend, now wife, um, we started in about 2010, 2011. Uh, that's when we first graduated university. We both were working corporate Australia jobs. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, we, we were on relatively good incomes because we busted our ass through university. And um, yeah. yeah, it was just the whole story for us was all about how do we not have to work? You know, we're from pretty humble beginnings. How do we not have to work, you know, like our parents did immigrants into Australia, you know, they, they really paved the way. So that's why we chose property investing. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, it's, I'd love to say there's some sort of sexy story, but it's <laughs> really not. We just sort of invested, um, you know, using data, one property after another. Um, and yeah, I mean, the just really hard work, dedication and, and a lot of um, sacrifice, I would say, as well Excellent. to get to where we are. I mean, that's when you talk about those type of beginnings and it's probably, uh, again, I can relate to it, right? Come to this country with not much in your hand, uh, our parents anyway, but um, to then go on and what you've been able to change within one generation like this country, like I just keep telling everyone, like this country, it's something amazing where within a generation you have rewritten intergenerational wealth through property. Like that is just amazing, right, when you think about it, yeah? Totally, totally. You know, they talk about the, 
you know, like the American dream per se. Yes. I, I, I hope the American dream, dream is still alive and well, but I feel like Australia, it, it's like, it's the, it's a lucky country. It's the place to be. And I'm, you know, there's always luck involved in building a property journey. Like, let's be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know where else I could have done it except Australia. I hear, mate, I hear. And that's why when people say, look, our property is a little bit expensive in Australia. I'm like, just look around this country. Yeah. <laughs> look at the produce. Look at the freedoms, the liberties we have. Look at the, look at our winters, mate. We're walking around May, but today it's winter and I'm in a t- I was in a t shirt. Yeah. You're in a t shirt. <laughs> um, this is our winter. Uh, let that sink in. <laughs> that's it. No, 100%. Ah, perfect, mate. Thanks very much. Uh, you mentioned before, you know, investing in property is a little bit of luck, but it's also luck meets opportunity meets, you know, being able to take action as well, right? So it's the intersection of that. Uh, so take us on your own journey as you reflect back. And you mentioned you've been in the market since what, 2010. So there's good, you know, a good 10 years of you know, skin equity uh, there as well as, sweat, as, as also sweat equity. So a bit of the highs, successes, a bit of lows, learnings. Uh, take us through what happened and how the how the journey unfolded for yourself and girlfriend, now wife as well, Peter. Sure, sure. Um, I think let, let me start off with the lows and then kind of build up to the highs. I think initially as a lot of people start, you know, like you want to invest in property, but there's just so much information out there. I mean, back then there wasn't podcasts like this per se, but there was seminars and right. Or, or webinars or you know a hundred different things these days it's even worse you know every second ad on facebook youtube is about some sort of property yeah. thing and so what i found and this was the case with us is we were like completely overwhelmed yeah. with too much information and, and and more so like marketing misinformation you know these concepts of like 10 properties in 10 years oh, you awesome. know anyone on an average wage can do it retire in 10 years and, and i was like I mean, I hope that's true, but it sounds a little bit too good to be true. You know what I it's mean? A wonderful tagline, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, I, I was really into data. I still am, obviously, but really yeah. into data. I was an investment banker with an eco- econometrics background. So when I, you know, like anyone with a kind of skeptical or analytical brain, they sort of reverse engineer what these promises are promising and and they quickly realize that I don't think that's actually possible for me um, mm. and that's kind of where we got to with all of these you know you'd go to a hotel room with a seminar and there'd be someone saying stuff that you know was really nice and appealing but then they'd try to flog you a property at the back of the room at a discount or something and I was we were just like you know, it kind of put us off. a dirty feeling almost at the end of it. Yeah. 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 I mean, you and I can relate to it because we kind of, to some extent being there and done that, you know, we know the industry, but yeah. as someone who's, who was new back then, I was just like, this property industry seems like really um, toxic in, in one sense. So we kind of, that was one of the low lights, I, I would say, kind of saying, I know that property can do something for me, but I can't find anyone that I can trust. Uh, that, that was the honest yeah, truth. I said, I said. Um, and, you know, so then I sort of just took things into our own hands. I, I had a data background. So um, I sort of built a system. It wasn't perfect, I would say, but taking 30 to 35 data factors, um, correlating them using a statistical regression technique over 30 years of Australian property data, you know, I was, I was trying to build some sort of, not sort of magic algorithm, but some sort of method behind the madness you know it can't just all be about oh buy within 20 k's of a capital city buy on a you know quiet street buy a brick house you know capital growth to the moon and back you'll be fine i was like well if that's all it is then why why isn't everyone just driving around ferraris you know every day Uh, there's got to be more and so you know when you look at those myths when you look at people saying oh you know properties closer to the ocean grow more and then you plot those suburbs you plot those properties over 30 years and you find that actually that doesn't stack up the data doesn't prove it then your whole concept and perception of property investing completely changes yeah and that's what it did for us because we went deep into the data for ourselves for no one else like we weren't trying to sell anything it was just for ourselves so yeah. the highlight or one of the highlights i would say was buying our first property kind of you know, edging towards the, to, to the water, so to speak, and, yeah. and buying, you know, taking that plunge and was like, 
is my system going to work? And, you know, it's not like it doubled in two years or anything, but it worked. It's done really well. Um, that was in East Gosford at the time. And, oh, yeah, and from that point onwards, it was just like, okay, let's refine the system and, and also kind of learn the street smarts, you know, how to buy under market value, so to speak, mm. how to buy off market, negotiate. And I think the real highlight was just finding a method for myself, really, not anyone else that sort of was rinseable, were repeatable. Wow. That was the biggest highlight. And I, I think just to end on a low light, even though I promised I wouldn't, <laughs> uh, one, one low light, which I think is worth sharing, actually, is like I bought this property in Cairns in 2015 at that time. You know, Cairns was dubbed the food bowl of, of Asia. The Aussie dollar was coming down. Therefore, tourism was going up. And there was like these billionaires from Hong Kong investing in this big casino project. So, you know what we always hear, right? Uh, if infrastructure is doing all well, the infrastructure. In place, <laughs> yeah, it's all about the infrastructure, you know, that property market's going to boom. And in the next five years, that like that property, I think I bought for 390 or 400, something like that. It was literally like just the worth the same amount. So yeah. for that property, I kind of ignored my own data system and I got sucked into the inf infrastructure play and it did nothing. So one low light, or you could say learning, was that, you know, macro factors, you know, interest rates, um, you know, a GDP, Aussie currency, you know, all these macro factors, they're important, they should be considered. But if you invest just solely on them or depending on them, mm. you know, that's, that's not a good strategy. Oh, well said. Well said. I feel like it's what do they call it a confirmation bias, right? Where mm. you start to then seek out that information. It's like, I mean, you could almost say you've got a confirmation bias right now of the market falling. So everything you're reading is about the market falling. And whereas you can flip it on its head, going, well, actually, this is a buying opportunity over the next, say, six to 12 months where the market, you know, the rates go up. It really depends on which type of media or information you're consuming. You can build your bias off the back yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I feel like you've taken a little bit of that bias out of it going, right, let's let the data do the talking and help us make that decision. And then maybe a little bit of gut feel, maybe a little bit of talking to then go, right, this could be a, this could be a worthy investment because there's data, but the data will only get you so far, right? You still need a human to then, the human brain to then make the decision. That's probably where things come unstuck a little bit. Right? Yeah, no, and that's kind of, I think that's where the wisdom comes into it as well. Um, you know, like you can take a, uh, a, a qualitative or quantitative data point, like let's say mm -hmm. the number of social housing in a particular suburb, and it might put you off, you know, it might, yeah. you know, you might think, ah, oh, the suburb's not for me, the street's not for me. But when you talk to a local property manager, who's, you know, boots on the ground, yeah. then they'll say that actually this social housing is completely presentable. There's no um, hooligans here. It's not rough around the edges. It doesn't even look like social housing. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of have to marry up the data with real life, what's going on i will say well said i'll get back to the example because you mentioned about buying in cans right but it's not the cans it's more the price point that i want to chat to you about so 390 for example even then it was that was a good price point and then what happens is people then tend to to buy based on price point right so like i want to buy under 500k for example and then that's that lets them buy you know say if it's 400 or 450 i can buy two at 400 instead of one at 800 yeah. So as you reflect and look back on it, is it a matter of the debate is always quality over quantity? Uh, and then is it, do I buy one at 800? Do I buy one at 400? Now, they're going to be very different assets, to, you know, 400K versus 800K property. You must get that question come up from time to time from you know, prospective clients, for example. How do you tackle that, PK? Yeah, no, it's, it's such a good question. And I, honestly speaking, I don't think that there is a binary answer to yeah, that like exactly. i think it's nuanced um like on one side of the equation you have you know the people who um, espouse the school of thought that quality over quantity every single time and and that's true right um however you know you have the other side of the equation where it's like you know a bit of a vanity vanity metric i have eight properties i have That's 10 right. properties i have 15 which is you know meaningless it did, what are they doing for you yeah however at the same time i, I want to make this point that and it's a really important point that sometimes we can over egg this argument of quality over quantity and and what i mean by that is you know clearly I, like i'm in brisbane so clearly a property in a place like New Farm, which is going to be more than a million dollars, 
blue chip, quote, quote unquote, that is going to be a higher quality property than somewhere, let's say, 20 Ks, um, you know, away from the city in Petrie. You yeah. Know, let's, let's go with that. So objectively speaking, one is certainly higher quality um, and than the other. However, if you had bought one new farm property, I'm just making these numbers up, for a million dollars, you could have alternatively bought three Petri properties um, for 330 each. So the portfolio value would be the same. And if you fast forward, you know, let's say two years, three years, four years, five years, it's the Petri portfolio that's outperformed the new farm portfolio of one property. So it's not that we favored Petrie just because we are able to buy three properties and quantity over quality. No, mm. it's it comes down to which suburbs are most likely to improve. And it's not just those which are quote unquote blue chip. And, and you're a broker, you know this much better than myself, Aaron, that when you buy, I don't want to say cheap properties, but when you buy more affordable properties yeah. with a higher yield, the bank likes that. The banks like that. They consider that yield or cash flow to be more favorable and your total borrowing capacity is egged up, you know, just a little bit more versus buying one, 1 million property at a 3% yield. So I don't know if I actually done a good job of answering that. I feel like I've confused everyone or myself included, but it's, it's not a binary answer and it, and it depends on your strategy in terms of lending and it depends on which suburbs you're considering, but definitely I can say that just at a high level, it's not just about quantity over quality. Yeah, well said. And uh, you're exactly right. There's so many layers to that question, which is well, how much deposit do you have? Because that's ultimately going to determine how much you can buy. What yeah. does your future borrowing capacity look like? Again, you may say I want to buy a new, new farm, but if it doesn't, you don't have the borrowing capacity, you just can't do it. And then ultimately it's, okay, look, three properties, but there may be three in a row and then you've got a development opportunity in the, in the future. And again, well, hang on, that's not a level playing field anymore. So yes, yeah, spot on, a really, really good example. Um, but it's a question that comes up, you know, for a lot of aspiring investors, the vanity metric, I'm like, don't get caught up in the number of properties. Hmm. Sometimes less can be more, but also what does that portfolio actually entail on how they're performing? So and thank you very much. Um, one of the questions that I really want to ask you is as we start to see rates go up, so not even it's not even a question, that it's a matter of when and how much as opposed to if because rates are going up, which is then going to start to change the tide on how investors you know, perform, how their portfolios grow and, and develop. But there's something interesting I heard you say, which is rate resilient areas. And I've seen a couple of, you know, a couple of articles you know, start to throw this around a little bit, which areas or which type of properties may, you know, may overcome rate rises and, and, and have that level of resilience to it. What are your thoughts and what's your outlook on, on, on these type of properties? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really super question. And, and I think you kind of alluded to it before, Aaron, that, you know, depending on which type of content you consume, you can be swayed, <laughs> you know, like, oh, interest rates are going up. Um, therefore, property market will come down is a very easy thing to say. But mm. once again, there's layers behind that. So, I mean, just to pick on one layer for, for today, I, I suppose, affordability. You know, everyone thinks that, and it's true to a large extent, that property is unaffordable in Australia. However, that's mostly like a Sydney, uh, Melbourne phenomenon. You know, that also exists in other parts of Australia, but just to kind of generalize, that is mostly a Sydney, Melbourne phenomenon. So if you think about the data, like this data is a year old, so granted, but it's from ABS. You know, about um, of, of all the mortgages in, in Australia, of all the mortgage holders in Australia, you know, those that are paying, um, I think it's more than, or, or sorry, th- those that are paying less than 25% of their disposable income towards their mortgage, okay, so less than 25%, that is more than 75% of mortgage holders. All right. So in other words, um, the vast majority of people who have a mortgage across Australia are paying less than 25% of their disposable income after tax as mortgage repayment. So when you think about that, you actually realize that on an aggregate basis, housing is still affordable. Now, if you look at that number for Sydney, it's it's not less, it's not the same, it's higher, same with Melbourne. So the question becomes, all right, 
I am a property investor or I want to become a property investor. I'm a little bit scared, you know, rates are rising, doom and gloom. Yeah. But where are the pockets? Where are the suburbs? Where are the cities? Where are the towns where, you know, maybe it's not even 25%. Maybe where are those areas that people are only paying 10% of their disposable income towards mortgage repayments? And so therefore, if rates rise to, let's say, a more neutral level, whatever that is, let's just say two, two and a half percent, then that is just gone from 10% to 15%. It's still very affordable. It's like no one needs to all of a sudden call their bank and say, I can't make repayments. Bad. Right. So I, I just want to, that's like kind of the first thing to kind of demystify and unpack Australia because there are 15,000 suburbs in Australia. It's more than just Sydney, Melbourne. Um, <laughs> And so, like, the logical next question becomes, like, okay, well, where are these areas, right? Like, yeah. talking so much talk, but where are these areas? And and there's literally, like, dozens of them. And, and there are no secrets. Like, mm. you know, you've got places like Bendigo and Victoria, places like Tamworth and New South Wales. You've got places like Townsville, Toowoomba in mm. Queensland. And then, you know, you don't have to stick with regionals. You can also go to a place like Perth yeah. with the second highest incomes in Australia and you know prices are actually going price are going up you know places yeah. like adelaide price growth is accelerating despite interest rates going up so you got to have to you kind of have to like deep dive and understand why that's happening and it's mm. because of affordability so oh, yeah there's a bit of a waft but I, I feel that that was like really important to to share and i think all the good investors recognize this fact yeah well said and exactly, just to finish on that point, that's probably a strong, like the, a really strong way to finish, which is good investors, because investors aren't created equally. There are a segment of the investor market who will freak out when rates are going up, or you know, lose a little bit of sleep over ten or twenty dollars, or maybe a, a week or two's vacancy. Where there are other investors that have done their numbers, that are confident in their own skin, going right. We've we've mapped out the worst case scenarios: vacancy rates, issues with the property, whether that's maintenance, whether that's uh, strata, whatever, whatever issues come up, they can face that. And then the other one is from a lending, the other one's macro. So if property prices stagnate, they can live with that and they can sleep with that, whereas others are going to lose sleep. And they're probably the investors that detract from, they're the ones that probably have the loudest voices sometimes and detract others from investing in it because they've had a bad experience as well. Yeah, no, that that's a really good point. And um, like just yesterday mm-hmm. or last night, I was talking to, one of my clients, he bought in Toowoomba at a 5.2% yield. And I, I asked him point blank, you know, interest rates are rising. There's 5.2% yield, even though it's positive cash flow, the property pays for itself right now. Yeah. In a year, in two years time, you know, this property may not pay for itself. Like, what is your view on interest rates rising? And, and he said a very interesting thing to me. He was saying, Despite what interest rates are doing, I know that this suburb in Toowoomba rents are going to rise between three and five thousand dollars in the next twelve months, which will more than offset, you know, the additional outgoings because of rising interest costs. And and I think we're in this kind of point in Australian property cycle where overall there's headwinds against property price growth on an aggregate basis. However, there are tailwinds in terms of rent increases, you know, where there's a housing crisis and there's not enough, you know, basically houses in Australia for everyone who wants to rent. So even though you're not going to get another 20% capital growth across Australia, um, you know, the the rent is going to keep chugging along and more than chugging along, it's powering home. So it's a kind of a very unique, I don't think we've been in this situation where the housing market is going to be a bit soft, relatively speaking, yeah. but the rental market is the hottest it's ever been in history. Yeah, yeah, such a great perspective, mate. Thanks very much for sharing. And I mentioned before about some investors going to feel this way and, and other investors are going to have this sentiment as well. And, and part of sentiment is built around community. Yeah, we've spoken about confirmation biases or, or you know, the school of thought you, try, you subscribe to, but a big part of that is who are you surrounding yourself with how are they lifting you up and what's the information they're sharing and giving to you as well? And when I talk about community, I would have mentioned at the very start, I mean, again, the vanity metrics when you talk about how big your community is, again, we'll talk about quality over quantity in, yeah. in your own community, but I feel like that's one thing that you've really done differently. Uh, and that's what I call like the done for you model, which is say the traditional buyer's agents where you give the fee. And I know you've, you've mentioned that a few times without doing things without a buyer's agent. 
versus the done with you model, which is I'll help you, but you've got to help yourself a little bit more as well. And that's where your, your community kind of plays into as well because they will buy properties, haven't traveled to see them, you know, haven't engaged a buyer's agent, but they're making fairly big decisions for themselves as well. So there's a couple of parts to this question. One is, have you engaged your community? Have you built that as well to then have a, have a really good following? But then also within that community, how are people then kind of peer-to-peer learning and helping grow each other as well? Because I think that's a really good part of nurturing. Yeah, no, it's a, such a good question. And, and I think I, I don't want to take any credit, but I, I found that in Australia, at least, it, the dynamic for a consumer or property investor was very much, I have an option to either consume all this free content, you know, just yeah. like this podcast is great yeah. and have a crack, you know, I'll do it myself. I'll buy a property, build a portfolio myself, or I got to outsource this thing to, you know, buyers agents or property companies, you know, yeah. of which there are awesome ones and they're like in any industry, not so awesome ones. Yes, yeah, There was nothing in the middle. And, and when I first started, like, a, you know, I was saying, I would have loved for there to be something in the middle where, yes, I am being taught systematically how to do something, but I'm able to actually understand it and make the decisions myself, as opposed to Aaron telling me, oh, mate, I found this amazing property, you know, sign here on the dotted line. You know, this is going to bring your dreams come true because there's infrastructure project going in, you know, like, sorry, I'm using you an example. No, no, no. I've been been plenty of... uh been sold to plenty of times so don't worry <laughs> <laughs> but that that kind of middle ground yeah. as you said um what did you say done with you i think that's a cool yeah. way of saying it um that was lacking so that's where i started my facebook group uh the youtube community and yeah like of course i have life experiences and a particular way in which i view the world so yeah. everything is biased, right? Because I'm an expert in one thing, not in another thing. Sure. However, the community aspect allows people to also bypass me and talk to each other. Like just this morning on the Facebook group, you know, there's great question. One lady was asking, oh, what are your experiences, guys, on Mildura? And I chipped in saying, oh, look, we were buying there a few years ago. It's probably risen too much now. And then another person said, oh, but there's this pocket that hasn't grown too much and has great zoning and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, you know, by crowdsourcing, not money, but crowdsourcing knowledge, that is powerful. I I find that that's powerful. And and of course, you know, a lot of clients come through that community, but then at the same time, I get messages every week from some person who says, "Uh, PK, I'm not a client. So sorry about that. I didn't buy your mentorship program, but thank you for the free content and the community. I ended up buying in this suburb and it's doing really well. So it's like, you know, that puts a smile on your face as well. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. It's, it, it means that your heart's in the right place because if you want people to then go through your we'll call for what, you know, what a lot of I've seen um, sales people do is put them through a funnel. You've got to buy this, upsell here, for example, and then you get access to me, which is, that's not the case. Great people are always great buyers, agents, great brokers, great accounts. They're just going, look, here's my knowledge. I want to give it away because I want to help people not make these mistakes. Whether you choose to come with me or not, it's a very different story. But at least if I can impart some knowledge and some wisdom, at least we can lift the tide and, and raise, the, raise the level of conversation a little bit more to have good investors. I think that's, that's a wonderful way to pay it forward. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And it, it sounds a bit soppy and, and fluffy and things like yeah, that, yeah. but I, I genuinely have experienced that the number of people that you add value to you genuinely help yeah. you know it it pays back you know then trust is built goodwill is built and even if they have already bought a property you know a lot of them you know through the community they buy a property and then for the second one they say oh pk this time we really want to optimize and not leave any money on the table we want to do the course so it's like maybe there's a selfish angle in it but really there isn't it's like you're just adding value and the people who vibe with you, they come forward anyway. Awesome. Awesome. And exactly that. The second that you feel like that icky feeling when the word selfish is used, the same way with this. I'm like, don't, you don't have to use me as your broker. In fact, find a good broker that you connect with. I may not be the one that you actually love or connect with, mm. but as long as you know which questions to ask, that'll put you in a better place. That's all we're, I feel like our businesses are in the, we're in the confidence game. Yes. So that's our team. We're not here in the loan game. We're here in the confidence game. Help make, 
investors make confident decisions, better decisions, and whether they go with us or not, we've done our part, which is at least helping them take action. After that stage, that's, that we can lead a horse to the water. After that stage, yeah, that's that's their own decisions. But yeah, I feel like yeah, and that's that's the biggest shame, isn't it? Like when someone has some knowledge, you know, yeah. you've led them to the water per se, but they just don't have the confidence to take that next step, that yeah. that sort of just last step. And you're, you know, I remember like two years ago in the middle of COVID when everyone was screaming, you know, depression and housing <laughs> yeah. crash and the usual 40% crash theories yeah. and predictions came out. And, and I, I was trying to educate everyone based on real data, based on economic data, based on affordability, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it's like, it's all there. The yeah. writing is on the wall for a pretty solid property um, mm. you know, growth story over the next two years, but you, you just can't get someone to actually take action. They have to do that themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's podcasts like this that, that really help, I think. Ah, I appreciate that, mate. Thanks very much. Uh, just as a last point, a bit on going back full circle to it personally. So where, what happens to yourself next? Like the next step, I don't want to probe. It's, I don't want to overstep the line here, but where to next for the, for the Gupta family in terms of what does your next investment look like what are your future plans and developments yeah no great great question um i don't know, I don't know if i have an answer <laughs> it's crisp and clear but um you know after many many years of rent vesting basically 10 years of delayed gratification we bought our you know quote unquote dream home um very recently on the gold coast so we're moving down there um sort of set us back a little bit so we don't have we're not flush with cash per se at the moment um, uh, it's, uh, but, uh, but you know what I'll, I'll just touch on that because i feel like just what you've said then is rent vesting got you to here i feel like having a family specifically now having children that changes because you go hang on now we've got kids we want to have a stable base for example we don't want to keep moving that's where bernie and i certainly feel like going ah oh, rent vesting was good but now we've got to a different stage in life which is children family stability want to put roots down mm right let's think about buying our own place as well so I feel like yeah I can I can that's it no that's that it point. and everyone's different as well yeah. um, and truth be told if we had not invested in property we would not be able to have bought the home that we have bought oh, so yeah. it is due to the returns that the Australian property market has given mm -hmm. over the last 10 years so we're very grateful for that and um, yeah I think you know once we sort of settle down I think the next thing is just to keep on keeping on you know the yeah, exactly. the method or the, the formula that we seem to be using and clients are using seems to be working so far who knows it might crash and burn tomorrow but yeah we'll just carry ah, on uh, it's <laughs> the test of time congratulations mate i want to say um well done well done it's uh you've got a story that i feel resonates with a lot of people whether they're people that have come to australia had to build their lives whether it's people are just you know that their parents and this is what quite often people's parents haven't bought property they haven't had you know that role model for example that that know-how or people just want to better themselves and they look within one generation how do we rewrite our financial story and then teach our kids to be better with money or teach our kids that there's a great way to invest in property as well and i feel like that what you've done there is lift the, and raise the bar mate so congratulations no thank you man i i really love that we yeah that word rewire like we do Often as immigrants as well, we need to rewire yeah. the way we think about finances because the way to get ahead is not save, 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 save necessarily. <laughs> and I mean, I'm probably level with you. Like we both had, you know, we worked in an investment bank. I had a banking background, working corporate. That was what our parents came to this country to have that as the outcome for us. Get a stable job, you know, be proud to work somewhere. Going out on our own is seen as much more for risk. And why would you do that? Hmm. However, if you and I have a gift and we've got itchy feet being in a corporate, then scratch the itch and go out there and do the best you can, right? 100%. 100%, man. Wonderful. Hey, mate, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, your generosity, your, your knowledge, your insights, but most importantly, just for being a cool cat, man. I think you just, you know, it's it, there's no sales part to it. You, you don't know how to sell. It's just going to look I enjoy what I'm doing. It's got me a good lifestyle. Therefore, I want to help others. And I think that's when it comes from that place of love. Um, I think you're so well-centered, mate. So you're going, to go, you're going to go the distance, mate. And congrats on your success and mate, turning your house into a home, mate. Well done. Thank you, man. I'm very grateful. I appreciate it a lot.